Amen. I love the song, O Holy Night, don't you? Brother, Brother Brady did a tremendous job on that. Reminded me of something back in March when we had this the shutdown. You may remember that, that we have a, a little thing going around. What is it? Um, oh, COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> one thing the Lord put on my heart was that we are blessed here at First Baptist Church with some tremendous talent in music. Appreciate it. Mrs. Green, the choir, I think, right now is just doing a great job. I'm privileged to lead them right now, only temporarily filling in. Now they're doing a great job. And so back then I had the idea, if Lord let us build a little tiny music studio, we'd try to get some good music out beyond the First Baptist Church and beyond that. And so back then we put some plans together. Now we're in the, in the makings upstairs of knocking some things down, putting up a few walls, and we already have the majority of all the equipment. And so, Lord willing, in a few months we'll be able to get some music out here from First Baptist Church, uh, home spun, homegrown music. And hopefully a blessing to you and to other folks. And, and I have heard this many times, that uh, people are blessed by the music here at First Baptist Church. And I've been blessed by it almost every service, if not every service I come to. And I'm so thankful for what God is doing here. And don't take that for granted. And uh, boy, God is good to us. And thank you, Brother Dalton, for singing that uh, tonight. We have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. I'm going to start my Christmas messages next Sunday, but that's not this Sunday. And so we're going to continue on as we look at the spiritual armor and in our spiritual battle. We are in a battle. We're in a battle that's of epic proportion with eternal consequences. We're in a battle that God has put us in. God has called us to. And if we're not careful, we will blindly, the word we used a few weeks back was frolic, through the fray and the frenzy. I'm afraid that as Christians too often, that is our attitude as we walk in this world. Half-hearted, slightly opposed, and when we do take a stand, it seems to be for all of the wrong reasons. Bless God, I will never fill in the blank. Now, we ought to take a stand on some earthly things, but that's not our main priority. Our main priority is for God and his kingdom. Just go on Facebook for two minutes or less, and you can see Christians taking a strong stand for the wrong things. I've read many articles and with, this, uh, with this shutdown to each their own, but uh, I, call, I read one the other day where the pastors were calling churches to shut down again. They said, if you love people, that's why we're open. Well, we have the same reason. We have the same love. We just view it differently. We view it differently. We're going to look tonight at the spiritual armor that God has called us to put on. Look in Ephesians chapter number 6, starting in verse number 10, where the Bible says, Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I'm glad you're good at other things. I'm glad you're accomplished. I'm glad you're talented. But please, please, please don't miss being strong in the Lord. I'm glad you can fix things. I'm glad you can crunch the numbers. I'm glad you can be, b bake and, and make beautiful things, especially around Christmas time. Boy, our house is always filled with goodies from this church. And not only can, can the people here sing well and worship well, they can cook well. But don't just be strong and fixing and cleaning and, and financially. Be strong in the Lord. All right, that's what the Bible says. Be strong in the Lord. Know him. Love him. Be strong in the book. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not my might. It's not your might. It's his might. Any true strength in this life will come from him. Oh, we can make good commitments. And in January 1st, many will make resolutions. And I hope you keep them. I've talked before when my time, when I exercised at the YMCA, every year around January, we would call what we would have, show up would be called the Resoluters. And they'd be there for a solid two weeks. I mean, solid two weeks or less. And then life would get back to normal and the faithful few would come. Listen, we can make resolutions and you ought to make commitments and goals and things like that. But I'm not strong because of me. I'm only strong because of him. Jesus says, without me, ye can do well, most things. You can live your life. You can raise your family. You can op operate your equipment. You can work your job. You can pay your bills all by yourself. But that's what we think. 
That's how we live. Come on now, that's how we live, isn't it? Oh, we know what the Bible says, but we really know how we live. And the Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I don't want just human victory. I don't want just to accomplish some human things because we put our mind to it. I want God to do something. This is why right now God's doing something at First Baptist Church, not because of us, but in spite of us and through us. This is not a time to grow a church, right? This is not the time, yet what is God doing? He's growing his church. It can't be done. You're right. But Jesus said, with me, all things are possible. Be strong in the power of his might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Tonight we're going to look at just the first piece of the armor. I wish I could get through all the armor, but there's no way on God's green earth I can get through the armor tonight and give the time that I believe we need to have. I would give us one thought, though, as we begin tonight. The Bible twice here says, put on and take the whole armor. Have you ever left the house not fully dressed? Almost. James, can I tell the story about you the other day? I'm not allowed to. Probably not. James came to school the other day. I, he said, yes, it's too late now. I already started. <laughs> this is something that we all could have done. He comes to school and realizes when he takes off his coat that he forgot to put on his uniform shirt. This past year, we, took, we have uniforms for the elementary students, and they look tremendous, but the Goldham has just chose a great, a great company, and they look, the kids just look so sharp. And he had on this long sleeve exercise shirt like this uh, soccer shirt he, he wears under his uniform shirt. He gets here and realizes that he's not fully clothed for school. And he's like, I don't know, Dad. He comes back down to me, and they're looking for a shirt, can't find one. I don't know how I did I thought I had it on. I don't know, James, you obviously don't. I've done similar things like that. You get dressed in the dark and you realize you grab two shoes. And they're not the same. <laughs> I've put things on inside out before. Have you? Wow, that's weird. These pockets feel really weird right now. <laughs> I can throw things on the inside of my pants. And while we can laugh and a little jolly about that, how sad a state we are in as Christians when we casually and randomly grab parts of the spiritual armor that God has given and provided for us. Well, we would be mortified and horrified and embarrassed to show up to a place, and, a public place, and not be fully dressed Yet we seem to not even care to wrestle, not against flesh and blood, to walk in this world and not even seem to care if we're fully equipped. How embarrassing. But beyond embarrassing, how shameful. And it is no wonder that we seem to be defeated. That the church seems to have no power that Christians seem to see no victory. It's not because God has grown any weaker. It's not because God's desires have changed. It is maybe because, if I can submit today, because we are not doing what God has told us to do. See, the battle is not always something we can see, but the stakes are high. The stakes are eternal. Life is and death. We are fighting for our church. We are fighting for our families, our children, our marriages, our homes. We're fighting for people to spend an eternity in heaven. The stakes are that high. 
and we're, we're just going to run out like we're ready for battle? The battle is not always something we can see, and whether we realize it or not, we are in this fight. Well, pastor, I don't want to be. Well, I'm sorry. If you're saved, you are. If you've asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, and I hope and trust that you have done that, if you're here tonight or online tonight and never trusted Jesus Christ, please, please, end of the service, call us. Come up front. We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. And by trusting in him and him alone, he will save you and promises you a home in heaven. Especially during these uncertain times, know your eternal destiny. But if you've settled that eternal question, understand something, my friend. The Bible says, finally, my brethren, all right, if you're a Christian, you are in the fight. You're either winning or you ain't. But you're in the fight. Well, pastor, I feel like I'm getting beat up all the time. You probably are. You probably are. Yet God has promised, like we looked at the past few weeks, victory. We can deny it. We can reject it. We can ignore it. We can scoff at it. We can scoff at other Christians. Wow, they're really all in, aren't they? I don't want to be like that crazy place over there. Boy, they're really committed. You, you can laugh and mock and reject. It doesn't matter whether you realize it or not. We're in the fight. We are. And we have been fully equipped and enabled. Everything we need... Everything we need, God has promised to supply for us. That's what he says in Peter. All things that pertain to life and to godliness. Not just most things, not just some things, but all things. Say that with me. All things. Guess what's excluded? I'll help you. Nothing. We are fully equipped. We are enabled. And so if we're not seeing what God has promised, then something's wrong. Tonight, I'd like to, with the Lord's help, look at this first item that's mentioned. In verse number 14, Paul says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Tonight, just for the next few moments, I'd like us to look at this concept of having our loins girt about. We don't talk that way that much now. Girt about. Have you girted yourself today? Are your loins girded? But we'll look at it with the Lord's help. I think shed some light and hopefully be a help to you as we are in this battle together. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray you'd help me the next few moments to speak clearly. Lord, you know I've tried to, to study and pray and seek your face. But Lord, I need you. I need you to speak through your word. Lord, help me to say those things that would be helpful and clarifying. But Lord, I ask your spirit to touch us, to challenge us and convict us. Lord, may your word bring about true and lasting change. Lord, you have been so gracious to us. You've let us see folks saved and you let us see folks added to your church. Lord, you let us see some victory. Lord, help us not to take that for granted or to neglect to do our part. Lord, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. There are times that people will use an object lesson or an illustration about Scripture. Those are helpful, but they always have an element of, uh, or a place where it eventually it kind of steers away from the object lesson. You can find object lessons for children and take a, a pencil or take, a, for instance, a red pen and I read one earlier about a red pen. No one likes a red pen on a test. Everyone wants to see uh, a good marks, not a lot of red marks. And they talked about how in our life we don't want the red pen of God to affect our life. We want his, his uh, c commendation, not his condemnation. And that's helpful. But there's also times that the Bible uses illustrations. Those are always true. 
Those don't have any holes in them because the Bible's presenting the concept. For instance, Jesus said, let me tell you a story, give you an illustration about two men, a wise man and a foolish man. The wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man on sand. And when the storms of life came, the wise man's house built on the rock, Jesus Christ, it withstood the problems and turmoils and tests of life and eternity and the foolish man on sand what happened as the song goes went splat went flat now that illustration is true you build your life on Jesus Christ your life will be built on a strong rock solid foundation and if you don't prepare to go flat you will go flat it may not be the first storm all right, it may not be the second storm, but there will come storms that that foundation cannot withstand. This one, give us your best shot. Send the tsunami. That's all right. Jesus Christ is my foundation. It will stand. There are times that the Bible uses an illustration. And here, the Bible uses for our spiritual armor an illustration for us. It equates the armor with real armor and some elements of that armor, some places where that armor helps us, some ways that that armor helps us. We can look at these lessons, we can learn these lessons, and tonight, the first piece of the armor that the Bible asks us to put on, to take, to assemble ourselves with, is truth. It's truth. Truth is under attack. This is no surprise. Truth has always been under attack. If you go back in your Bible to the Garden of Eden and where the serpent comes to Eve, what is, it, what is under attack? The truth is under attack. Satan, the deceiver, from the very first opportunity, wants to tear down the truth and wants to put question in our mind about truth. I read about a research poll recently about what adults in America thought about some truth. And they said, according to this Barner Research poll, that most adults reject the notions of original sin. They reject the notion of the existence of Satan and reject salvation by God's grace alone. Most Americans, they said, tend to think that the core documents of the world's major faiths, such as the Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon, are, quote, different expressions of the same spiritual truth. Now, I don't know if you caught that statement, but let me explain it for you real plainly. The Bible, the Koran, and the Book of Mormon are not different expressions of the same truth. Things that are different are not the same. All right, one is true, everything else is a lie. If I said I am wearing a purple suit, that would be a lie. You could not say, look, Pastor Howard is wearing a blue, shirt, a blue suit, a purple suit, and a red suit. Oh, that's neat. Those are different expressions of the same truth. No, one is true, the rest is false. He went on to say that most Americans apparently believe that praying to the dead can reap personal benefits. It can't. There is no benefit to praying to dead people. That's why we pray to God through Jesus' name. He's not dead. Oh, he was. He was for three days. <laughs> Now he's not. He's alive. We don't pray to Mary. We pray to Jesus. God the Father through Jesus' name. We can ask Jesus anything. We can boldly approach the throne. We don't pray to Mary. The thought is by praying to Mary, you have an effect because she's the mother of Jesus. And yes, she is the earthly mother of Jesus Christ. But I don't ask anything of Mary I ask Jesus. I ask my Savior. I ask my high priest, and I can boldly approach the throne. And so truth is under attack. I could spend time talking about the truths of culture being under attack, but that's not the point. 
We could spend the rest of the night talking about some core issues of truth, but I want to look at truth itself and give you three points about truth tonight and, and having our loins girt about with truth. The first point is this. There is the centrality of truth or that truth must be central. The Bible here uses the illustration of your loins girt about. The concept, as they tell me, I have never fought in a war, and especially not one in Bible's times. I wasn't alive then. But they tell me, who are they? People smarter than me. Who is that? Most people. They tell me that in armor during that time, what you would bind around your armor would be like a sash or a belt. It would hold all of your armor in place so as not to hinder you while you were in battle. Or in essence, without this piece of armor, you would be flopping and flailing and clanging around the battlefield. The centrality of truth. You see, tonight I have a belt on. Oh, I was going to take my belt off. I should be able to without taking my microphone off. Here we go. I have a belt. There's my belt. Now, here's the problem, folks. Hey, Mike, that's a problem. Let me get this mic squared away just a second here. Here's the problem. We view... We view truth as we do a belt, that it's just an accessory. It's just an accessory. I can wear a belt or I don't wear a belt. My pants don't fall down if I don't have my belt on, as you can see. Now, I have some, belt, I have some pants where belts are a necessity. Some of you may be wearing pants and you're like, oh, don't take your belt off, Pastor Tyler, that could be a problem. No, my pants will stay up just fine. I got them birth and hips. I'm okay. <laughs> we view, we view in the armor of God truth as an accessory to our life rather than it being essential. In the armor of God, there's a centrality to the truth. It's an essential part of our being as a Christian. It is not decorative. It's essential. It's not an accessory. It's essential. It's not an option. It's essential. Truth is essential in your life and in my life. And in the armor of God, when he says, have your loins girt about with truth, he says, listen, I want you to have truth all around you, holding everything together, all surrounding you, and strengthened by the truth. See, truth in this particular context brings a readiness. Putting the armor on without truth, I'm not ready for battle. My loins girt about with truth. Now I'm set. Now I won't be hindered. Truth brings a readiness. Truth requires preparation. I'm going out to fight. I don't want anything hindering me. But truth reveals our equipping. You see, if I'm not wearing armor, I don't need something holding it together. I can wear it or not if I want to. If I'm wearing armor, I have to make sure I have that or I'm going to be sunk when I get into battle. There's a centrality to truth. By truth, we know who our enemies are. By truth, we know what true victory looks like. By truth, we can clearly make the right choices. By truth, <coughs> we can see the path we ought to take. Another place, the Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you by the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, without truth, we are lost. Without truth, we are failures at best. Without truth, we will not know who to battle, how to battle, and if we've been victorious. 1991, they asked some people, do you agree or disagree, strongly agree or strongly disagree with the following statement? Here is the statement. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, absolute truth is the idea, the truth, that things are for certain. Gravity on earth is an absolute truth. 
Absolute truth on earth, right? Outside of the atmosphere of earth, gravity changes. God is absolute truth. Deny it, accept it, reject it, believe it, whatever you approach you take, God is still true. So he asked these people, do you believe, do you believe there's such things as absolute truth? Here's what the response. Only 28% of the people in 1991 expressed strong belief in absolute truth. And then they said this, I read this, more surprisingly, only 23% of born-again Christians accepted this idea. That was in 1991, the survey, so according to that survey, over 75% of born-again evangelical self-professing Christians who would say, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, over 75% of them responded with, I'm not sure there can be absolute truth. No wonder our churches are upside down. No wonder we haven't seen victory like, like we think we're supposed to see. No wonder the church of Christ is not growing because we don't have, or we don't believe we have the truth. You see, my friends, there's a centrality of truth. In your life, it's not just a good idea. It's not just a nice thing. It is central. It is essential to a believer to have and to know the truth. I'm not just talking about, hey, you know what, I make sure I always tell the truth. You ought to tell the truth. You ought to be a person of character. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having the truth as it is revealed in the Word of God. The truth to be able to perceive error and falsehood. So that when Satan comes, the wiles of the devil, the deceptive one comes to you and begins to tempt you. You answer not in your commitment, not in your strength, but in the truth. When the devil tempted Jesus, what did Jesus use? The truth. He used the truth. And not only is there a centrality of truth, but I want us to notice because of this, the characteristic of truth. Why is it so important? Why is it such a big deal? If you would turn in your Bibles to Titus chapter number one. Would you turn there, please? Titus chapter number one, verse number two. In Titus chapter number one, we see something about our God and this idea of truth. Titus 1, Paul writes these words through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in verse number 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, and read those next four, three words with me, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. You see, we hold truthfulness as a character trait. That young man is truthful. That salesman, he's an honest, truthful guy. That advertising was, was false. It's a, it's a character trait. Someone is either truthful or they're a liar. They either lie or they tell the truth. We want our kids to be honest, and we don't want liars in our house, not to be deceptive. And we hold truthfulness as a character trait. But the fact is, truth in relation to God is not just a character trait. It is the characteristic of God. It is his essence. God is truth. You know why prophecy is so important, why it's such a big deal? Because once God says something, it will happen. It is as good as done. It can happen today, it can happen tomorrow, or a thousand years from now, but it will happen. In God's economy, because he is truth, if he thinks it, if he says it, it is done. It is done. We may not see the effects of it yet, but it is done. God is truth. He doesn't just contain truth. God is truth. It is his essence. What he thinks is true. What he says will be true. It is as good as true. It is done. The very nature of God is truth. It is not that he makes a choice. Do I tell the truth or a lie? Everything that God utters, everything that he is, is true. So when the Bible says, have your loins girt about with truth, it is not that I say, well, I'm going to be an honest man. You ought to be an honest man. I'm going to be a good young person. I'm a good young person. I'm going to tell the truth. You ought to do that. It is that I take the very nature of God himself, and I'm strengthened by his essence of truth. This is why deception is such a big deal. 
Satan is the opposite of God. Everything Satan does is a lie. Everything God does is true. So I make a choice whether to embrace and to put on and take on the character, the nature of God, or I take on the nature and character of the wicked one. The Bible says it this way. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because, speaking of the devil, there is no truth in him. There's none in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's what Ephesians 6, 11, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 6, a passage we're in the night, we'll see in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles, the deceptions of the devil. Everything that the devil brings will be in deception and of deception because the Bible says zero amount of truth abides in the devil. So when I girt my loins... When I put on the truth and surround and I'm strengthened by that truth, I'm strengthened and surrounded by the very nature of God. To deny truth is to deny God. Jesus says it this way, for I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is truth. There's not only the centrality of truth, there is the characteristic of truth. Rejecting truth is to reject the nature of God. Minimizing truth is to minimize the essence of who God is. Exalting anything else is to exalt the devil. And I cannot expect to defeat Satan when I exalt him. Let me give you one more point. I gave you some concepts. Centrality, characteristic. This is what I would call where the rubber meets the road. Third point tonight, the call to truth. So what does that all mean? Right, Pastor, I'm with you. Amen. God is truth. Right, Pastor, on my armor, I want to put the truth on. Good. Good, good, good. How do we put on truth? Let me give you a couple thoughts tonight. One, you seek truth. James 1.18, of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. You see, when I take this word now, if I ignore it in my life, I don't just mean in the mornings, you ought to to spend time with God every single day, and if you don't, you're not putting on truth. You're not equipped for battle. But beyond that, it ought to not just be in the morning. I don't just hold my belt up and put it back down. I put it on. So throughout the day, I've got it on. It's useful to me. Hook, Hook my microphone to it. So I read God's word, I spend time in the word of truth, and then throughout the day, this word of truth girds me, supports me. I seek it. I have a decision to make. I don't go just to my mind. I go to the word of truth. You want to have on truth in your life, the nature of God, then you've got to seek his truth in this book. Psalm 119, verse 30, I have chosen the way of truth. You want to have truth in your life? You have to choose the way of truth. Sometimes, oftentimes, usually, this book rains on my parade. It doesn't let me act and think and be like I want to act, think, and be. I cannot go my own way and pretend to have my loins girt about with truth. If I want these good about with truth, I must be acting according to Psalm 119, verse 30. John says it this way, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. One step at a time. There's a centrality of truth. There's a characteristics of truth. But then there's a call to truth. You want to have your loins good about with truth? Then tonight, walk in truth. On the way home, drive home in truth. Interact with your family in truth. As you go to bed, 
Make sure your mind dwells on truth. That's Philippians 4, verse 8. Think on these things, whatsoever is true. But what, what I'm saying is that if you're going to claim to have truth and love truth and be like God and want to have your spiritual armor of truth, then it's got to affect every aspect of your life. You can't just show up with it on Sunday and say, all right, I've got my truth with me. Here I am. You know what? It ain't doing you any good that way. The call to truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If you want some victory in your life, you better get in this book. You better get in deep in this book. Oh, there'll be some things you won't understand. There's things every single day I read I don't understand. God, why'd you put that in there? You know why? I don't know. I wish I did. One day I'll find out. Sometimes you study more like, oh, that makes sense. That's why. Other things, I imagine I'll get to heaven. I know that I can't know everything in here. But I'm going to try. Loins girt about with truth. You spend truth with your family. You have some devotions with your family. Some truth. I want my family girt about with truth. Don't you? You see, we say amen. That's right. God is truth. Amen. Central in my life. Amen. All right, kids. Oh, we can't have family devotions. Where's the truth? Where's the truth? There's a call to truth. I'll give you three little words or three little phrases. Love it, learn it, and live it. Love it, learn it, and live it. Some of us can just start the loving it part. Oh, this is boring. Oh, my friend, jump in deeper because the Bible is an amazing book. In the vernacular, it's a really cool book. Man, there are so many cool things in this book. I mean, God, the promises of God, the mind of God, the acts of God, the ways of God. It's amazing. Wow, Lord, you did that? You chased people with hornets? Oh, those, mur those murder hornets, they, they weren't 2020. God did that. You used mirages? Lord, wow, wow. You know what, Lord, you did all that? My little problem would be just fine. Our loins girt about with truth. Winston Churchill said this, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. I don't believe that Winston Churchill was speaking about spiritual truth, but the statement is just as true. We stumble over it and hurry off as if nothing happened. How many times have you been touched by a sermon, touched by a truth from God's word, and you stumble over it? Oh, that's it. That was me, Lord. You touched my heart. Maybe you pray. Maybe you come to the altar and pray and get right. And the service is over. Your time with God, with God is over. And you hurry off as if nothing happened. You want to have your spiritual armor on? The Bible says, have your loins girt about with truth. And this truth is not just something I know, though I must immerse myself in it. It must be something that I love and that I live. Not only seeking truth, but I'm strengthened by truth. I'm strengthened by truth right here and right here. Sometimes this doesn't match this. Sometimes this makes this go like this. And this says, is that true? Is God really like that? You see, the truth strengthens me. James says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Then he says this, draw nigh to God. God is the God of truth. He cannot lie. He is truth. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Strengthened by truth. Someone was talking to Abraham Lincoln one time. Abraham Lincoln responded this way to this disputer. Well, let's see, how many legs does a cow have? And the reply came for, of course, rather disgustedly. That's right, Lincoln agreed, but suppose I call the cow's tail a leg. Now, how many legs does the cow have? Well, five, of course. And Lincoln said, well, that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. 
Truth tells us that cows only have four legs. When regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. You want to know why there's lack of victory in your life? Because your regard for truth has been broken down. Well, I'm busy. Okay. It's boring. I just don't get anything out of it. I just don't see the point. No matter what the wiles may be. And Satan knows exactly what will click in your mind. When regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things remain doubtful. My friend, have your loins girt about with truth. Hopefully tonight, your regard for truth has not been broken down. If it has, come back to the God of truth, who gives us, as the Bible says, the help of the spirit of truth. To be guided by, the Bible says, the word of truth. You see, all around God is truth. To put it simply, come back to God. God, your truth, it's not just what I like. It's not just what I desire. Lord, it must be what I crave. And Lord, help me to have that truth surround me so that when the attacks of the wicked one come, and they will, they will always come with deception, the wiles of the devil. There is no truth in him. The truth from God's word, the truth from the spirit of God, the truth from God, the essence, the nature of God, will enable me to see through the attacks. See, the armor works because I'm strengthened, surrounded, enabled by truth. But if I disregard truth, my armor's just flopping around. That's why it's such a big deal. Lord, I thank you for your word, which is truth. Lord, I pray that tonight if we've been minimizing, Lord, disregarding the foundational aspect of truth and how it relates to you, Lord, that we'd get right tonight. Lord, such a fundamental integral part of our armor, truth. And Lord, I'm afraid we casually set it aside for anything else. My friend, in just a moment, the instruments will play. If God touched your heart, you come do business with God. Is truth central in your life? Is there a hunger, a crave, a sensualness to it? Or has this devil deceived you? Has he caused you to place it aside? Give it a nice little place. It's an accessory. It's a decoration. But it's not essential to your life. You can't see victory without the truth. You won't see victory without the truth. Our homes, our families, our very lives depend on it. Lord, bless this invitation. Guide us now in Jesus' name. As you stand to our feet, head bowed and eyes closed. If God's touched your heart. You respond to the Lord. Folks are praying now. If God touched your heart. You respond to him.
Lord, thank you for the truth you've given to us. Lord, may we as your children cling to your truth. Lord, may it uphold us, may it strengthen us, may it cause us to be able to see the wiles, the deceptions of the devil. Lord, may it surround us and strengthen us. Lord, thank you for your word, for your spirit, or for working in the service tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.